Back a few years ago, when I tried to belt it out too. I'm sitting on top of a John Deere tractor, thump, 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 going down the hill in Kansas. And I was belting that song out so loud that a guy that was talking to my brother-in-law at the edge of the field could hear me sing and about it. That's a beautiful song, Morty. Thank you for sharing that with us. You know, I, I have to agree that names can be really, really confusing. Um, I mean, uh, Gladys Dunn and, and uh, Yuan Meboth. And uh, then years ago, uh, when I was in California, I was driving down the road on the way to uh, teach a computer class. And this guy on the radio had the most interesting accent and the most interesting conversation. And they announced his name, Alice Turbe. Yeah. And I thought, Alice Turbe. Hey, did I hear that? Alice Turbe? That's a weird name for a guy. I mean, this was definitely not a girl with a masculine voice. This was a, a guy. And, and it took me for a while to realize that it was Alistair Bay. Bay. <laughs> and he's a great preacher. I've actually had a chance to meet him face to face here and speak uh, uh, a couple of times. He's really great. Uh, I'll tell, tell you one other one, too. Uh, a guy was walking in Chinatown, and he came across a dress uh, tailor shop that was owned by Sam Ting. And he thought that's a weird name for a uh, Chinese man. Uh, no, no, it is Zen, uh, Zen Bordson. That was the name, Sven Bornson. So he walked in, he says, are you the proprietor? He says, yes. Are you Sven Bornson? He says, yes. He says, how did you get that name? He says, when I came over uh, to the United States, I was going through immigration, the guy in front of me was a Swedish guy named Sven Bornson. And they asked me my name, and I said, Sam Ting. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, get over your Bible to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to spend some time there today. And uh, although that stuff's entertaining, different clicker. Yes. All right, let's see. That one was the way I want to go. All right. Um, we're going to take a moment and look at some things here that maybe some of this is old hat to you. But you know what? If you've seen it before, it's a refresher course. One thing I have learned, uh, I've dealt a lot with power positive thinking and motivational speakers and stuff like that. We need to be constantly reminded. That's part of the reason why we come to church. Partially, among other things, to be reminded of the vow that we made when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord. To remind us of the love that God loved us so much and He, he wants to have a relationship with us. Boy, uh, so if this is old hat to you, consider a refresher course. If it's something new to you, take it, arm yourselves with it, and let's go out and fight for the Lord. All right. We are soldiers for Christ in the army of God. The score is 3-0 and in your favor. Satan has the ball on the one-yard line. It's first down, and there's five seconds on the clock. This is the last play. Your strength against this final run determines whether you win or lose. Now Satan wants to beat you forever. Yep. I'm going to take a real quick over here to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, because it just kind of helps to set the stage. We are going to be in, in division, so stay there. But 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, or know the name for Satan, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He will lie, cheat, and steal to win this game. Mm -hmm. He doesn't play by the rules. He wants to destroy you. And so he is a threat to our future. Now, I'm going to personify the devil here just a little bit. I'm going to call him the atheist. I'm going to call him the American Civil Liberties Union that is not civil, and they do not care about our liberties. And I'm on a war path. I'm really feeling some animosity toward the ACLU. And I praise God for those organizations that are now going out and challenging them in the courts and beating them almost every time. But I'm ashamed that we as Christians let down our Christian armor. And we went to sleep on the playing field and we let them get this far ahead of us.
So we've got some work ahead of us. We've got some challenges to do. The homosexual activists also who want to silence Christians in church and tell us what we can and cannot believe or what we can and cannot say, these are the people trying to defeat us in the game that God has called you and me to run. Now you may feel like, well, I'm just a spectator. No way. You're a player. We've been going through this kind of a series related to the theme of football. And I've got a couple more messages. We'll see how it goes with it. Uh, but we want to talk about a strong defense today because we are in the game. We're not spectators on the sideline. Now some of us act like spectators on the sideline. And I hope to challenge you. I hope to motivate you. I hope to inspire you that you will stop being a spectator and that you will engage even more in not letting evil walk all over Christians and our rights and offend us and, and hurt our feelings and so forth. Amen. If you notice in the book of Revelation, we're not going to go there right now, but in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, there's seven letters to seven churches. The bottom line in each of those letters is the little phrase, to him who overcomes. What is the difference between a winner and a loser? That's what we want to look at today. We equip ourselves for this and every other tack that Satan tries to throw on us when we follow Paul's instructions in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 19. So let's go over to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the might of His power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of the evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after that, you've done everything to stand. You know, I have a lot of people come on and they'll look at my dog tag. They'll want to know what I've got on my dog tag. It says, G.I. for Jesus. I got this not too long after 9-11. A friend of ours that was uh, working with the uh, Christ Church of Griffith Park in L.A. And a friend that saw this in the Bible bookstore and said, you know, Glenn would like this. And she got it for me. I've been wearing it ever since. It reminds me of what we are here for. We are involved in a war. Now, if it were a war of guns and bullets, I'd bring my guns, and I'd tell you to bring your guns, and we'd go down to the ammo store and get lots of ammo, and we'd go out and find some enemy, and we'd shoot, 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 shoot. And, and you know what? There'd be a sense of accomplishment as we saw them drop, 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 drop. But our enemy is not that way. Our enemy is, is one that works in here. He gets in here, he plants thoughts to do evil, and gets us to do evil, so we'll turn away from following God and we are on His side then instead of on God's side. So how do we fight this kind of an enemy? Number one, we've got to have a strong defense. So the first thing in our strong defense is a belt of truth. A belt of truth provides freedom of movement to fight. Back in Jesus' day, they didn't have nice pants uh, fitting that they could run around in. They basically wore long robes. And so to fight, they would grab their robe, they'd tuck it in their belt. That kind of freed up their legs so if they needed to run this way, run that way, they could run this way, run that way, and they were better in a position to fight the devil or the enemy, whoever that was. He says to gird yourself with truth. I want to go over to John chapter 18. Verse 37, this is where Jesus is on trial before Herod, or Pilate. He back, he's uh, back to talking to Pilate. And Jesus uh, has just said that my kingdom is not of this world. But Pilate says, you are a king then, said Jesus. Jesus answers Pilate, you're right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. Now Pilate, unfortunately, de deals his cards and he says, what is truth? Pilate doesn't know. 
Part of the reason we're having with the atheists, the ACLU, the homosexual activists, those who are speaking out against the church and, and telling us we can't pray in Jesus' name or we can't be Christians in public or, or have a church next door to their house, uh, Richard will probably talk to you about that next Sunday, is because they don't want to recognize God and Jesus is the truth. And we have to live that in our lives so that we will see in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but by me. We are fighting this war to show the world that God loves them and that God has a plan for their life, that His truth will change your life for the better and will open the door to eternal life with Jesus. To lie to be, be to remove your belt. Your pants fall down and you would be exposed. And you won't be able to fight. So we don't want to go around engaging in untruths. When we say things to other people, we want to make sure that what we're speaking is the truth in love. Now, sometimes we speak the truth, but we don't do it in love. And that builds walls instead of bridges. We can't conquer enemies by building walls. We've got to conquer them by building bridges. So we speak the truth in love, and we let the devil be the liar. We let ourselves be the ones who speak truth. That's our belt. The next thing is our breastplate of righteousness. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14 says, Stand firm. Then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and the breastplate of righteousness in place, the breastplate of righteousness protects the vital organs, the heart, the lungs, the stomach, the liver, things like that. Now, righteousness is right living. And sometimes we say, well, my righteousness is just like filthy rights. Well, yeah, that's right. Your righteousness will not save you from sin. It will only keep you from committing more sin. So we still need Jesus to save us. But, when you make a right decision, that is right living. When you said, I want to come to church and worship God and love Him with my heart and soul and mind and spirit, that was a right decision. I'm glad you're here. When you say something to a neighbor or to a friend, God bless you, or, or Jesus loves you, or, or however God gives it to you to say, you're saying a right thing. We went out to a restaurant, a Burton Steakhouse last night for our anniversary. And we've gotten in a habit of asking the waiter, we're going to pray for our food. Do you have a prayer request we'd like to pray for you? Well, Corey come back and he said, really? Wow! Then he said, my son accepted Christ last week and is going to be baptized next week, would you pray for him? And we were excited to do so. Glory. Out of the years that we've been doing this, it's been maybe two, maybe three times, uh, maybe one or twice that they said, oh no, don't, don't pray for me. Uh, we prayed for him in hell. <laughs> There's been a couple times when they didn't know what to ask for, for prayer. We prayed for him anyhow. But almost every other time, either for themselves or for a family member or a close friend, they've had a prayer request. And we've been able to pray for them as we prayed for our food. That's a right thing. But you do your job. Now, your, your job may not be in a church or a religious setting. You may be out there in the world. But when you do the right job, that's right living. If you're the best worker on your, in your company, that's right living. Do it because you're doing it for Jesus. Do it as a role model for the Lord to see how to live right. Right. God wants you to do what is always right by God's definition, not by a glimpse. You know, the world says, well, I'll decide for myself what's right for me, and you can decide what's right for you. Well, there's the only problem with that is that some people think it's all right to go murder their ex-spouse, or their spouse, or ex-spouse, and, and they think they shouldn't be punished for it. It's better to do right and get no thanks than it is to do wrong and get no punishment. So yeah, I did the right thing and nobody recognized it. Nobody said thank you. Nobody gave me an award or an accolade or a pat on the back. So what? 
God knows I did the right thing. I don't have to worry about it. Do not let sin into your heart. Wear your breastplate. I'm going to flip over here quickly to Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, because I believe that verse is relevant. Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. You've got your Bibles with you. This is a good exercise in learning how to look up Scriptures in your Bible so you can follow along. And I encourage you to bring it. I encourage you to do that because, well, we're going to talk about that next time. Chapter 3, verse 9. Referring to Jesus being found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes by the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God is by faith. The most important righteousness you have is your relationship with Jesus Christ. If you build that relationship with Jesus Christ, it will motivate you to recognize I'm being tempted to sin and I'm not going to go down that road. I'm going to go the right way. Build your relation. That's why getting to know Jesus is such an important Bible study. And I covet your prayers that we can get getting to know Jesus Bible studies in every church in the United States. That sermon wouldn't be complete if I didn't put in a plug for that, would it? <laughs> it's going to have to become a trademark over the rest of my years. Polk County right now, Glenn. <laughs> well, 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 okay, with your help, we'll start with Polk County, Polk County. Let's get and, County. And then we'll get the world going. Okay. Well, let's go on to the shoes of the gospel of peace in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15. With your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Now shoes provide a firm foundation to stand on. That's that inner peace. That knowing Jesus as your Lord. You can be in the middle of a battle. But if you know that Jesus is the Lord, the outcome of the battle is irrelevant. If I win, I live to keep talking about Jesus. If I die, I get to go be with Jesus. What's the problem? I don't like being in this battle. I don't like fighting for my life. But if that's what I've got to do, that's what I've got to do. I don't like engaging people that hate Christians and confronting them or being confronted by them. I found that in most cases, if I take the initiative and I speak out for Jesus, that puts them on the defensive. That gives me a little more calm uh, upper hand. And a lot of times, they'll back over to a corner or a cower uh, if we aren't so timid. Too many times we Christians have been timid. They come out against us, and then they've got the upper hand, and we're kind of like, oh, I don't want to say anything because they'll persecute me. They'll call me names. They'll, they'll look at me funny-like and, and things like that. And that makes me feel very uncomfortable. Well, our inner peace comes from our relationship with Christ Jesus. The more you sweat in peace, the less you will bleed in war. Hyman Richtover said that, uh, World War Ace for the German army back there during World War I. But you know, there's still a lot of truth in that. That was the Red Baron, wasn't it? He was the Red Baron. Red Baron yeah. yeah. There's still a lot of truth in that statement. Uh, let's work for peace, but let's, let's stand for it. Let's not just kind of cower over in the corner and hope that trouble doesn't come our way, because it will. Our feet are to carry the message of Jesus Christ to a lost world. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus is just getting ready to be lifted up, and in verse 8 He says to the apostles before He ascends into heaven, But you will be received power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be My witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That call to those 12 men, actually 11 right there, and, and later Matthias was chosen to join them, and later Paul was recruited to join them, is the message that you and I are called to carry. Now maybe you're still working at a car dealership, maybe you're still driving a truck, maybe you're still cleaning bathrooms, or whatever your job is, but you are in that job, and in your interaction with the community, carrying the gospel of peace. Let's talk about the shield of faith. Verse 16. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith which, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The shield of faith, we keep it and we're kept safe by it. It's God's protection against Satan's arrows. Now, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, start getting over there in your Bible. That is a significant verse 
in relation to this, and I want to plant this verse deep in your heart. This was a real encouragement to me when I was preaching in Wasco, California, and I realized it for the first time. Now, I'd read it before, but hadn't always thought about it. But 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There's no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful, and He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up against it. There's no, I, in my opinion, there's no such thing as a, well, I didn't know I sinned. You know when you're sinning because there's a temptation that precedes that sin. And you can say yes to that temptation and sin, or you can say, wait a minute, I'm being tempted, I'm not going to go that way, and say no to that temptation and turn away from sin. So God gives you the power to turn away and shield off Satan's arrows. Are you doing it? The problem is so many of us Christians, and, and we've all done this at one time or another, and some do it more and some are realizing that's not the way to do it. We let down our shield. We're looking at things that we shouldn't be looking at. We're going places we shouldn't be going. We're doing things that really aren't the best way of reflecting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior in our lives. And then we wonder why the world wonders about those Christians. They're just nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. <clears throat> Deep in our despair, we want to keep looking to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us, the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and not lose heart. Sometimes this war is weary. And some of you have been fighting this war for a long, long time, and you're saying it's time for the younger people to step up and fight this war. I got a challenge for you, though. I got a little bit of a perplexity here, if you will. The fact that you're still breathing and still alive means that you're still in the war. So whether you want or not, <laughs> reminding me that I'm going overtime already and I haven't even gotten started yet. Whether you want it or not, you're still in the war. We talk about the dash at somebody's funeral, and that's all the things we like to remember. Oh, they did this, they did that, that that's so beautiful. Some people have a horrible dash. But you know what? It doesn't matter what the dash is, it matters how you finish. And if you finish believing that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, this could be the ugliest dash in the world. But you're going to heaven. If you've lived a righteous dash and you've been the nicest person the neighborhood has ever known, but you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord, all this righteousness is but rubbish. It will not save you from the sins that you have committed. Because without Jesus, there is no salvation. We're getting on to the next one. It's not... Look at what the world has come to. The message is, look who has come to the world. So let's talk about the helmet of salvation in Hebrews, or Ephesians. Six, back 17. over here to my passage. Six, Chapter 6, verse 17. See, I can be fumble fingers through my Bible just like you. So don't feel bad if you're having trouble finding some of these scriptures fast. You just hang in there. The more you practice, the better you'll get at it. There we are. Chapter 6, verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation. The helmet protects the control center. The brain. When you sin, where does that sin originate? Right here. The devil puts a thought in your mind, and you either say, ooh, or you say, oh. Which is it going to be? Are you going to go after that sin? Or are you going to say, wait a minute, I'm being tempted to do something I should not do. Now, salvation, like sin, begins in the mind and is carried out through the body. 
Your actions reflect where your mind is at. What were you doing yesterday afternoon at 3 o'clock? Or Monday night at 7.48 p.m.? What kind of life are you living on the J-O-B? Are you reflecting C-H-R-I-S-T? Or are you sneaking things home that belong to the company? Or, or sitting back and kicking back when you should be working hard? What kind of reflection, what kind of actions are you taking to show the world that Jesus is your Lord? You take your helmet off, and Satan will take your head off. Drugs affect your mind. Alcohol affects your mind. Pornography, sexual immorality on TV or in movies. Oh, it's just a TV. It won't bother me. It affects your mind. Why do you fill your stuff with things that take you away from God when you have the power to live righteously because of who Jesus Christ is in you? Are you playing defense? Or are you giving in and letting Satan score that touchdown that's going to cost you the game? We've got one more to look at. That is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ephesians chapter uh, 6, verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The gospel is the good news. The word gospel literally means good news. And when you're talking about Jesus Christ and what He did for you, that's good news, isn't it? Everybody here says yes. Glory. I Glory. knew you were going to say that. What Jesus did for us is good news. And what we share with other people, that if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, all those bad things that you've been carrying around, all the guilt, the shame, can be forgiven. It can be taken off your shoulders. Yes. Some of you know the load that Jesus took off your shoulders. Hope you can just remember the difference before and after. So that you will take that testimony and share it with others because there's somebody else who's carrying that same load you're carrying or one very close to it. And when they hear how you got rid of your load, they can get rid of their load. And you can add another soul to the kingdom, to the Lord's team. The only offensive weapon in our armor, let's use it. In Matthew chapter 3, uh, John the Baptist is actually speaking here. I could have used where Jesus was being tempted. You'll notice that when Jesus was being tempted, that's what he used. But John the Baptist says in chapter 3, verse 4, John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he... You know what? Let me check something here. Aha! Uh -huh, that's a typo. I'm going to blame the guy that had his hands on the computers. John <laughs> chapter 4. And it is Jesus' reference. In, in verse 4, Jesus says, It is written... Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. In verse 7, Satan tempts him again. Jesus says, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And then in verse 10, Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written. You want to know a good way to combat the temptation to sin in your life? Do what Jesus did. Quote Scripture. And if you don't know the Scripture, get your Bible out and do some searching. It will be good for you. It will empower your mind. It will strengthen you for this war that you're fighting for your very own soul. And then there's prayer. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19. He says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and prayer requests. With this in your mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Verse 19 says, pray also for me. Now whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, the good news for which I'm an ambassador in chains. Prayer is communication lines back to God. It's communicating back to headquarters. It brings reinforcements. It supplies the faith that we need to stay in the game for one more play. You don't know if today will be the last day you're playing this game. We have some very young people here. And praise God because that's the future of our church. 
And I don't want to scare you. I don't want to be morbid or cruel or, 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 or harsh in any way. But we have to recognize that there is no guarantee that these young people are going to make it to be tomorrow's church. One of them could get called home today. I hope not. But let's be real. If you're living, you're old enough to die. <laughs> Regardless of what size you are. Hey. Some get dead before they get born. Though some of the rest of us have been around a little longer. We know that we're getting closer to that day. Are we ready? Are we in communication with headquarters? Do we have the reinforcements we need to hang in there? One more day. And sometimes you're going to feel like that's what it is. I have fought through and struggled through the Getting to Know Jesus ministry for 16 years now. And there's been more than once that I've thought, am I going to make it? I need one more day. And God has hung on to me one more day. And I keep working and pressing on because I believe that this is the solution to our nation's problems. That we learn about Jesus, we get Him so deep in here that we don't have to make an artificial move to get religious all of a sudden. That it's just being a Christian, that relationship is so natural to us that we don't think about it. That it just effervesces out of us like the bubbles out of your soda pop when you shake it up real good and you pop the top on it. That's what you want to be for Christ. Keep alert. That's guard duty against temptation. Learn to recognize temptation so you can fight it. And if you're in constant communication with headquarters, you've got the power of the Holy Spirit in you to help you recognize those temptations and to help you win those battles. Now there's one other thing I noticed about this Christian armor. It is frontal protection. Never turn your back on Satan or he'll stab you in the back. Don't give him an opportunity. Put on this armor by coming to Jesus Christ, by reading your Bible, by spending time with other Christians, by building your relationship, because you're in the war. Are you going to be a winner or a loser? To keep up with what is happening, follow Glenn Koppel, GMC for Jesus, or Getting to Know Jesus on Plaxo, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and check out other, our other videos on YouTube.